All righty, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Luke. I'm joining you here from the aquarium. We have got our virtual studio up and running here and all sorts of fun stuff going on. The program we're going to be doing today is going to be about animal adaptations in the oceans. I'm really going to be pretty open-ended with this. We're just going to be talking about adaptations throughout the program, and I'll say more, more about what that means in just a second. But before I do, I should say, if you have any questions during the program, or if you have any interesting observations you want to share or anything like that, you can text your questions into us at 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838 right here next to me there. You can text in to that number. And our director of education, Dave Bader, is actively uh, responding to and answering questions and also passing them on to me. So if you want to uh, get your, your animal questions answered, now's your opportunity. Uh, so, as I said, oh yes, and one more thing before we begin. If you are watching after this is over, if you're not watching live right now, you can still send us questions via email, which we will respond to over the next day or so. And that email we get those questions at is live at lbaop.org. So if you want to, again, if you're watching this later on, just go ahead and email us at live at lbaop.org, and we'll be monitoring that email continuously. And then, of course, finally, before you text, remember that standard data rates and texting rates may apply. And kids, remember to get your parents' permission before texting us. But if you do have their permission, um, and you want to let us know your name and even maybe what city you're contacting us from for anything, or anything like that, we'll be happy to give you a shout out on the air to you or your school or, or whatever you like. So uh, let us know. Text us. All right, let's get started. So as I said, today we're going to be learning about adaptations. Now adaptations in the, in the context we're going to be talking about refers to anything that a living thing has, whether, a body, whether it's a body part or an ability, a behavior, something it can do that helps it to survive. An adaptation for us right now is anything that a living thing has that helps it to stay alive, keep on doing what it needs to do. So these would be things that are part of the animal's body or things that it has naturally the capability of doing. And if we want to think about what some adaptations are, for me it's always really easy to start by thinking about the adaptations that we have as people. So, for example, if I think about my human adaptations right now, I can think, well, I've got hands. Hands are an adaptation that help me to, help me to survive, right? Now, I could probably survive without hands because it's the modern day and we have all sorts of fun technology. But imagine if I was living like a, like a cave person, like thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Having hands would have, been, would have been a really, really big key thing to being able to survive, right? And humans, of course, are able to come up with all this cool stuff that we do because another adaptation we have that's really special for us, I think we have the most special version of this of any animal probably, is our brain, right? We can think of things and do stuff that no other creature on earth is, is capable of figuring out how to do. Most animals have only the adaptations that they're born with in terms of their body parts and maybe a set of, inst of instinctive behaviors they can do. Some animals can learn a few new things. As we talk about marine mammals, we might see some examples of that. But most animals have a pretty limited list of what their adaptations are. Uh, but nonetheless, understanding what those adaptations are can tell us a lot about what those animals are able to do, how they survive in the natural habitat, and also how we might need to help them and, 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 and so on as the uh, future of our environment changes. So we're going to start, I think. Actually, you know what? I guess we've got, we might as well start with our sea lions. This is, it looks like Parker and one of our younger sea lions here in this picture. So what are some adaptations we see on sea lions? What are some adaptations on a sea lion? I wonder if we can get like a full body view of a sea lion. See if we can start there. Like, or a video, even better. Ooh, this is a fantastic video. So this is a bunch of California sea lions, it looks like, swimming around underneath the water in a kelp forest. So this is the kind of habitat that we are lucky enough to have here off the coast of California. Only occurs in a few places in the world, and this is a big group of sea lions. You can see them swimming around. They're, they're, it looks like they're socializing with each other. They're kind of playing a little bit. Looking at the camera, they're definitely curious about what this thing is that's coming in and looking at them. It's, it's probably a scuba diver holding it. But what adaptations do you notice? What things are they able to do? For one thing, I noticed that they're really excellent swimmers. And if we look at their swimming, of course, there's certain things about their body that help them to do that. So one great adaptation that you'll notice right away is these big flippers. Sea lions are a little bit different from their cousins, the seals, and the kinds of flippers they have. Because if you look at the sea lions here, you'll notice their flippers are real big up front, whereas the flippers in the, and the flippers in the back are also pretty large too. 
And then if you look at the sea lion, when any sea lion when they come up on land, you'll notice that on land they're actually pretty good at moving around. They're not as good at, as good at moving around on land as they are at moving around in the water. But sea lions are actually pretty effective at moving around on land because they can actually move on all fours. So when they come up on land, these back flippers that you see, the, you see they've got, they can bring those underneath their body and they're able to walk around on all fours. And actually they can, they can go faster than a person over short distances oftentimes. But if you compare them to say something like a seal, ooh, here's one of our harbor seals. So <laughs> this is two of our husbandry staff with uh, one of our harbor seals here. When seals come up on land, for one thing, look at those front flippers. They're almost more like little paws. They don't have the same size that a sea lion's flippers do. And also, the ones in the back don't rotate underneath. So when a seal comes up on land, they're able to sort of do the worm. We call it galumphing to, in order to get along on land. But they can't really move around quickly. So you can see here that this is similar concepts in these two animals. You've got flippers on both of these animals. But the different shapes of the different flippers allow them to do totally different stuff. The walrus, again, here's another one of their cousins. Walruses have pretty big flippers, more sea lion-like, really. And because I think, though, of their enormous size, they're not that agile up on land. But nonetheless, um, you can see a very similar body plan. But even within these animals that are, oh my gosh, walruses are hilarious. Look at this. Look at how proud of themselves they are. I mean, man, those... And that's the other thing about adaptations. So many animals in nature have adaptations that just seem crazy when you first look at them. Like those tusks, like those things don't get in the way. They're not like, a, they don't give you trouble sometimes, Mr. Walrus. Like you seriously, you just carry around these giant tusks and they're just useful? Well, yeah, they are. So whenever we look at an animal, even if an animal looks kind of silly or ridiculous, believe it or not, those adaptations help that animal in some way. They have to because otherwise the animals wouldn't have them. It takes a lot of energy to grow a bunch of tusks, and if walruses didn't, didn't need those for something, they would have lost the ability to grow them over, over the millions of years that, that all the walruses and seals and sea lions have been evolving. So as we look at different animals, we're going to see a lot of really wacky adaptations today. And it's always a challenge sometimes with those crazier adaptations to think, how do those help them to survive? Now, we got our first question of the day. Alexa asked, do sea lions swim in groups? Yes, they do, Alexa. Sea lions are actually pretty social. They oftentimes hang around in groups. Uh, they do sometimes get a little territorial. In particular, male sea lions do. Uh, but when they're hunting, they oftentimes work collaboratively or at least sort of semi-collaboratively uh, as, uh, as they go out and about. And they, uh, when we go on whale watches and stuff off our coast here, we oftentimes will see large groups of sea lions, sometimes 30 or 40 of them together, kind of similar to what you see here. But if you look at all these sea lions, you might notice that they, I don't see if any of them have, none of them have a big bump on their head. When you look at sea lions, you can tell a boy sea lion from a girl sea lion because the boys, like Parker here, have a big bump on their head. So if they're a mature male, they'll have this big bump called a sagittal crest. So if you look again at that video of the sea lions, do we see any sea lions in that video that have a big sagittal crest on their head? I don't think so. Let's look, maybe let's look at it one more time just to make sure. All the sea lions that you see moving here are either, are either females or juvenile males. There's not a single big male sea lion in sight. So they tend to maybe be, they oftentimes are more solitary, but that doesn't mean they never, they never kind of hunt with groups. Oftentimes with sea lions, it's like, you know, they'll, the females might move together and then there might be others that are more on their, on their lonesome. But if they find like a big jackpot meal, like a giant school of sardines or something, you'll see all sorts of different animals coming in to try to feed on that. Now, Ooh, now Camilla asked, do they socialize in the wild? Yes, they do. Sea lions are pretty social animals, but it depends on what you mean by social. So, and by the way, being social is another kind of adaptation. Uh, you, you might, if an animal, you know, is less social, if it's, if, it, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a less social animal that likes to stay away from other members of its own species, that's an adaptation for some reason or another. If it's a more social animal, it might, it, it might have an advantage of a different way. So, for example, I always like to use dogs and cats as examples. You know, cats, they like to hunt by themselves, right? They're very, they're, they're pretty antisocial. They don't like, to, except, for, except for lions, they don't like to hang out in large groups. So things like tigers and even house cats, right? They tend to kind of do their own thing. Dogs, on the other hand, they come from wolves, right? And wolves hunt together. And that's how they're, that's how they're able to do the really impressive stuff they do, like hunt buffalo and that sort of thing. So wolves are social hunters and, they, and that's a better adaptation for them. Now, Jody asked an interesting question. Why, why do people help take care? 
Huh? Judy. Sorry, Judy. Judy, I, mis I misread your name there. Why do people help take care of wild water pets? That's a, am, I, am I understanding that question correctly? <laughs> so the animals we take care of here, up here at the aquarium, I guess you could call them wild water pets. Um, they are all here so that we can learn from them, so that we can teach about them. Some of them are sometimes rescue animals. Uh, the seals and sea lions are not, but our otters actually are. So a rescue animal means it's an animal that isn't able to survive out in the ocean for some reason. Usually with otters, it's because maybe they, got, they lost track of their mom when they were a baby, or maybe they, have some, they had some health problem or something like that that meant they had to live in human care. So we have staff here at the aquarium. Our husbandry staff is what we call them. Husbandry just means animal care, basically, that take care of all of our animals, and, they, and we have special kinds of, of, of animal caretakers for different kinds of animals. So the folks that take care of our otters, for example, are called mammalogists because otters are mammals. The folks that take care of our fish are called aquarists, and they deal with not just the fish, but also with the invertebrates. And then there's also aviculturists who take care of our birds, things like the lorikeets and the penguins. And there's even other kinds of categories of animal care, too. But those are the three main ones for us. Now, this is a good question from Carol and Max. She was gonna, they were going to ask, what do walruses use their tusks for? So walrus tusks are essentially big teeth. And walruses use these for, primarily for digging around in them, uh, digging around, don't they? if I remember correctly. Yeah, this is, one of those, uh, this is one of those things that I have to refresh my own memory on as I go. But basically a walrus is, a lot of members of this family, seals and walruses at least, do, do a lot of bottom feeding, a lot of foraging on the bottom. So what walruses can do is as they're going along the bottom, they sort of lean their head forward and they just sort of dig things, they can dig around and dig things up with those big tusks. And remember the soil, the soil, the dirt at the bottom of the ocean is often very, very soft and pretty easy to dig up because it's just this very light silt that's been falling over time. So, and then they can also use them as weapons. So walruses, when they have disagreements, will use those tusks as weapons to fight each other. And you'll notice on quite a few of them that you see some of these, a lot of these, like some marks and stuff. You might see some signs of scarring around their, around their kind of neck areas. That might be from different disagreements they've had over time. But one thing about walruses, and this is true of sea lions and seals too, is in spite of the fact that they can be kind of territorial, they still are social in other ways. I mean, look at what these ones are doing here. These things weigh thousands of pounds and they're all like piling up on top of each other. This is, this is, they might want, they might, they might prefer to have a little more space than they do possibly. <laughs> but oftentimes you'll see the big pinnipeds. My favorite is, my favorite example is the elephant seal. If you go to visit elephant seals, there'll be, there'll be a stretch of beach that's miles and miles and miles long. But all the elephant seals will be all hanging out in this one spot, maybe just a few hundred feet across. And there's like thousands of them there and they just like to pile up on top of each other. It's an instinct they have. They like to be in close physical contact with each other when they're at rest. Now, ooh, this is another good question from, we're getting a lot of good questions about sea lions. I guess we'll just keep on going with pinniped adaptations for a while. Nathan asked, do sea lions eat each other? To my knowledge, no. Cannibalism, if it happens among sea lions, is pretty rare. Uh, but I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's happened at some point, maybe. But generally, sea lions can only eat small stuff. They don't chew their food. So it would be really shocking to me if we ever heard any encounter of any sort of a sea lion trying to eat another sea lion, because they don't really have the kind of teeth that would allow them to tear chunks out. Uh, the good question, though. Um, Benicio asked, how do sea lions attack their prey? Well, pretty much, Benicio, they chase it. So seals, so seals are a little bit different, right? Seals oftentimes are looking along the bottom. They're a little bit slower moving, and they'll oftentimes go along the ocean floor looking for some kind of hard-shelled stuff they can catch and things like that. Sea lions are very, very, are, are very, very agile and very, very quick to turn and change direction and so on in the water. They're very fast. And so they essentially try to basically, in this case, they're probably trying to scare stuff out into the open so they can, they can chase it down and grab it. But you'll sometimes also see them out in deeper water moving around a big school of fish. And sometimes they'll do this in association with dolphins and stuff too. Although they don't cooperate with dolphins, sea lions will sometimes hunt near dolphins because they're all kind of trying to do the same thing. And if you see a big school of fish out in the middle of the ocean, sometimes you'll see dolphins and sea lions and birds and sharks all trying to feed on it at once because they're all kind of push it into this tight ball. The animals aren't necessarily trying to help each other, but because they're all doing the same thing, the actions become sort of semi-cooperative. Now, this is a really good one. When walruses lose their tusks, can they grow them back? No. Walruses cannot grow back their tusks. Although their tusks do continue to grow, 
if you if a walrus loses its tusk, that's like taking out a tooth. So this is one of the reasons why walruses have had such a rough time. People used to hunt them for their tusks and for other things too. Walruses aren't hunted anymore, but no, but they do need to keep their tusks. It's just like the tusk on it's just like the tusks on an elephant. So walruses definitely have to keep those tusks. They sometimes in human care will survive if they lose one, but even then, it's a uh, it's something that definitely needs to stay on a walrus. And walruses have a lot of rough times these days, too, because walruses live in places that are naturally very cold. They like to spend time around icy environments. And as our Arctic Ocean warms up, the walruses are having a harder time finding all the things they need. And now that we've talked a lot about seals and sea lions and walruses, let's move on to another category of ocean animal and talk about some of their adaptations. Because we went off, we went off in all sorts of directions with the seals and sea lions. Oh, all right. So I... My colleague here, Alicia, who you might have seen teaching one of our other classes, just chose a real interesting animal to start off with. Does anyone know what this thing is? What manner of creature is this? If you guessed chambered nautilus, you're absolutely correct. By the way, if you're still wanting to send in questions, uh, let's bring that number up again so we can, uh, we haven't shown it in a while. If you want to text in questions to us, you can text us at 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838. And now that we've moved away from mammals, we've gone in a completely different direction to this very primitive creature we see in front of us. And when I say primitive, I mean it. This creature that you're looking at called the chambered nautilus is an ancient organism. They've been on this planet for a, they've been on the earth in their current form more or less for about 250 million years. They're what we call a living fossil. And 250 million years, that means that this animal you see right in front of you or I should say its ancestors were hanging out in the oceans at the same time that dinosaurs were on the earth. But in fact, in fact even just a little bit before the heyday of dinosaurs, um, but they're still here today. They survived the big changes in the earth that happened that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. You might remember that you know a meteor hit the earth and it killed all the dinosaurs, right? Well, the chambered Nautilus was, Nautilus was able to get through that all right because its adaptations allow it to do some things that probably still worked even when the earth up above, even when, even when the earth outside the ocean was a real mess. Because the chambered nautilus has a really weird way of living. What the chambered nautilus likes to do is it hangs out in fairly deep water and it basically floats around. And I know it might be hard to believe, this thing doesn't look like it could float, but believe it or not, they can move around pockets of air inside this shell of theirs and they can use this to control their buoyancy. And as they float around in the water, they use these long feeding tentacles to just basically reach out and grab passing plankton and small animals and so on. And that's what the uh, chambered nautilus does. And they have cousins that are a little bit more advanced. The uh, chambered nautilus is actually a really primitive cephalopod. Cephalopods are things like octopuses, squid, cuttlefish. Here's a more modern looking cephalopod, our friend the octopus. And as you can see, if you look at the octopus, the octopus's adaptations are a little bit more sophisticated in some ways. The octopus, for example, has all these suction cups. Those suction cups, of which the octopus has hundreds, allow it to be very specific and delicate in how it manipulates env its environment. If you look at the chamber nautilus, if we can go back to it for a second, the chamber nautilus doesn't actually have full suction cups. They have more suction grooves, and those grooves still work, but they uh, aren't quite as good as suction cups, I like to think. So the chamber nautilus isn't quite as, isn't quite as, uh, doesn't have as much dexterity, I guess you could say. Isn't as good with its tentacles as the octopus is. Now I got another question. Bodhi asked, is ad is, are adaptations like camouflage? Camouflage is an example of an adaptation. So any, remember, anything about an animal's body, whether it's a body part, something about its color, anything like that, that helps it to survive is an adaptation. And since we brought up octopuses, check this one out. This is a great example of, an, of a major octopus adaptation in action. This octopus is blending in with the rocks and seaweed and stuff behind it. And octopuses are better at this than almost any other animal. In fact, they might be better at this than any animal. Um, because octopuses have a very, very special adaptation in their skin. Their skin contains these special cells called chromatophores. You know how most animals, right, their skin is whatever color it is, probably the same with their fur. Some animals, maybe they have a different fur coat at different times of the year or something like that, but most animals, they stay the same color pretty much throughout their lives. You know, that's just how it is. You don't get to, they don't get to choose what colors they are at any individual moment. The octopus, and this is a 
about octopus demonstrating this here, can basically change not only the color, but also some of the patterns on its skin to blend into practically anything. And they can do this because they have these little cells that can open and close to reveal different kinds of different colors. So they might have a chromatophore that's got, you know, it's got a red, and it's got a blue, and it's got, and so on. And they can open and close those to reveal different colorations. And, and oh, it sounds like we have a lot of Nautilus questions coming. Very exciting. I haven't had to take Nautilus questions in a long time. So this is going to be, a, this is going to be a fun challenge. Uh, and if we want, we can watch some of that coloration change happening if we look at a video of a of a cuttlefish. So a cuttlefish is another member of that cephalopod group. And boom, watch that. You can you got to see it eat there. So this cuttlefish is hunting this little ghost shrimp or whatever this is here. And watch what happens when it catches the, the, the shrimp. And now it's going after a crab, which is a different cuttlefish here. After it catches its food, you can even see it happening now. Its body is shifting colors and everything. And then it changes. It becomes real dark for a moment. And watch this. And he's like, ah, and goes back to being really pale. So these, these animals can change their color almost instantaneously. What, what an amazing adaptation, right? All right, now I see we have more questions. Alexa was asking how fast a sea lion can swim. Sea lions are pretty fast. I don't actually know off the top of my head what their max speed is. Uh, 15, yeah, I would say, I would guess 50, yeah, 10 to 15 miles an hour, maybe, maybe a little faster in short bursts. Um, and let's see, what else? What is this? Well, let's, fi let's finish up with sea lions before we move on. Natalie asked another sea lion question. What is a sea lion's favorite food? You know, they like a lot of different things, but mostly they're into fish and, and uh, squid. That's pretty much all they eat. Sea, sea lions are a little different from the other pinnipeds. A lot of the other pinnipeds like to forage on the bottom. Sea lions, not so much. Sea lions are really midwater feeders. They chase, they chase fish around, eat squid, that sort of thing. Now, this is a great one. Um, we're back to Nautiluses here. Adam asked, how does a nautilus swim? It is a little bit weird. You can't really see it here in this picture. Actually, I guess you can. So first off, I mentioned earlier, the nautilus has this, has air inside of its, inside of its shell, right? It can move bubbles around in there in order to control how it floats. The nautilus also has, I think you can see it right here, this thing called a siphon, which is a little jet. And that little jet allows the chambered nautilus to Kind of, kind of jet itself around in the water. It's like if you've ever, uh, I don't know, I, I used to do this when I was a kid. If you have a hose and you go under the water and you turn on the hose, it'll push you around in the pool. Fun game, but, you're, but anybody who you do this with, they'll get really angry because you're wasting a lot of water. So you better be trying to refill the pool at the same time. But uh, anyway, but that's basically what they do. They push themselves around with their own kind of jet of water that they're con continuously taking in and jetting out. And they can, they can move around pretty well. They're not like... They, they kind of wobble when they swim. Yeah, it's a little silly looking. It's like they do this, but it's still, uh, it's not bad. It works, it works for them. It's worked for 250 million years, so it must be a good adaptation. Uh, let's see, what other questions do we have about nautiluses? How aggressive are they when they, and what do they hunt? Well, nautiluses are not aggressive to anything that's much larger than probably about, you know, I don't know about that big. They're not, they're, they don't go after really large prey items. Uh, at least not that I've ever seen or heard of. And as far as, as, far as the, the, the show aggression to anything else, no, not really. Nautiluses are pretty easygoing creatures. And it makes sense, right? Because the kind of instinct an animal has for whether it's aggressive or not is another kind of adaptation. So animals in nature tend to only be as aggressive toward things as they need to be to help themselves survive. So if it's an animal that, you know, uh, that's, that's a predator that has to hunt, so of course it's going to be aggressive toward the things it needs to eat. But if it's an animal that ha that's trying to avoid getting eaten, if it's trying to get away from predators, you know, some animals might defend themselves, but a lot of animals don't. A lot of animals, their favorite thing to do is to run away. So the Nautilus probably falls more into that run away category or swim away as fast as they can if something tries to come after them. And that was a good question from Bastion. Now, Abigail asked, why does the Nautilus have stripes? That is a good question. Oh, Bastion was talking about sea lions. Oh, it makes a lot more sense now. Well, Bastion, now that you brought it up, well, if we're talking about sea lions, sea lions actually can be a little bit aggressive, not just toward the things that they're hunting, but also towards things that interfere with their daily activities. So if you are uh, ever at the beach or on a dock or anything like that, and you happen to see a sea lion, leave the sea lion alone because sea lions are not very friendly to uh, interlopers in their territory. And furthermore, a sea lion bite is a nasty thing. So, 
but that, but if you leave them alone, they're very nice creatures. Now, uh, let's see. Why does the Nautilus have stripes? Abigail, that's a great question. And you know, I have to tell you, I don't really know that much about this one, but I will begin by saying the Nautilus's shell grows from a very, very small piece, which is actually by this point buried deep inside the shell, and it grows in a spiral as the Nautilus gets bigger, and it's called the chambered Nautilus because it fills in, it's, or it almost completely seals chambers as it goes and just leaves one little hole connecting each chamber to the last. And actually, I, do I have a shell over here? I don't think I have a Nautilus shell here on the table. But we might be able to find a Nautilus shell if we, uh, if we look around. Do we have one here in the room? I don't know. Yeah, if we, oh, here we go. Perfect. So if I go to the document camera, you can actually see, this one's a little bit broken, but you can see the inside of the Nautilus shell. So the Nautilus lives inside this big open part here. And you see here, there's all these chambers. As it grows, it seals off the old ones, or almost totally seals them off, and moves into the new one. And that, and as it does that, the shell takes on this striped coloration on the outside. But I have to tell you, I don't know necessarily why the Nautilus's shell is striped, but I have a couple of ideas about it. So for one thing, when animals are living in deeper water, being a reddish color is actually a pretty good idea, because red is actually kind of hard to see once you get deep down in the ocean. Very hard to see, actually. It almost looks like, it almost looks black deeper in the ocean. And anytime you have, an animal has a kind of a regular pattern, that oftentimes helps to break it up and make it harder to see from a distance. So if an animal's got, you know, a real, is, is, one, real, is one color that kind of stands out, it's easier for a predator to look at, look at it and notice what color it is. And if it's got a kind of a rippled pattern like this, for example, especially if you're underwater at a distance, you know, with, that might make it harder for a predator to really tell what it's looking at and it might not think that it's anything. So those stripes probably help in a, the Nautilus in a couple of ways. For one thing, you can see that coloration is a kind of a reddish brown, so that's a nice color to be if you're living in deep water like the Nautilus does. And again, that rippled coloration probably makes it a little bit harder to see. Now, we got so many questions, but again, that's just based on the basic concepts of how underwater camouflage kind of works. And uh, there might be other reasons that I just don't know. Uh, let's see here. What do Nautilus eat? Tobin and Bryson asked this one. Nautiluses eat small invertebrates mainly. They might occasionally catch a little fish. They're basically reaching out and grabbing things that pass by. And most of that's going to be thing with those, again, those feeding tentacles. And most of that's going to be, you know, mid-sized plankton and things like that. Now, we've gotten so many great, great questions. Uh, Kevin asked, how does an octopus know what color to change to for camouflage? That is an excellent question, Kevin. So, octopuses, and this is the craziest part about octopuses, um, if you look at an octopus's eyes, I don't know if we have a really good picture, but the cuttlefish video might show the eyes a little bit. Sometimes when you look at the eyes of an octopus or a cuttlefish, they look really, here we go, perfect. So when you look at your eye or my eye or any human eye or most, most eyes on animals that, you know, most mammals at least, you see that we have this circular pupil in the middle, right? An octopus or a cuttlefish or a squid oftentimes has this U-shaped or sometimes even W-shaped kind of pupil. It's all weird and bent. It seems very strange. And that seems odd because you would think that would make it kind of hard for the animal to see clearly. But we know just because of the fact that they are able to change color to match things so perfectly that the, all, these cephalopods must know what the colors are of the things around them. And we think that they're able to tell because different colors focus in their eye differently because of that weird pupil shape. So if it's green, the, the, if, the, if the cuttlefish is looking at something that's green, let's say, for example, it might have to adjust how its, how its eye is looking at it just a little bit, and it knows that because I had to do that, that means if I change my skin this color, I'll match. And if it's a red thing, it'll go, oh, well, I have to, I have to make my eye do this in order to be able to, see, to be able to focus on that, so I'm going to assume that I have to make my color like that too. So it's, they can see color, but they do it in a completely different way from the way that we do it. It's a really good question, and, and, we, and it's been a mystery for a long time. This is only actually recently discovered. We're getting so many questions here. So Spencer's asking, how fast does a Nautilus swim? Well, I've watched him do it before. I mean, it's like, how fast is that? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, like, not fast. Yeah, I, I, I would be surprised if a Nautilus was able to cover a mile uh, in an hour. Um, but uh, yeah, they're not very fast moving. They're pretty clumsy swimmers. Most of what they're doing is sort of, a lot of deep sea animals do this, actually. There's not a lot of food to spare in deep ocean environments. 
And oftentimes those animals just kind of float and just sort of wait for things to happen by and maybe make a quick jump to grab it. And that's more or less what the Nautilus spends a lot of its time doing. Though another thing they will do, they'll actually cling to surfaces sometimes as well. They'll, they'll actually hold on to stuff with their suction grooves, which is another kind of interesting behavior of theirs. Now what else? Can Nautilus blend in? They can blend in with some things. I mean, this one's not, blend, not doing a terrible job of blending in with the sand, but you're probably wondering if they can blend in with the chromatophores that some of their more, some of their more recent relatives have, right? Now, if you're wondering if they can camouflage, Nautiluses, not really. They don't have anywhere near the sophisticated adaptations that the other, that the more, uh, that the more, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, more advanced cephalopods have. And when we say primitive or advanced, can we talk about animals, by the way? Primitive, in, when we talk about, uh, talk about living things, means more like their ancestor. So this guy here, we call him a kind of a primitive cephalopod because this is probably what most cephalopods were like hundreds of millions of years ago. But subsequently, newer cephalopods have arrived that have different kinds of adaptations and are very, and are very different. Remember, cephalopods are things like octopus and squid. Now we are almost, well, we are over time, so I'm gonna take a few more questions before we wrap up. Um, do cuttlefish attack humans? That is a good question. Camilla asked that one. Not so far as I know. I've never heard of a cuttlefish attacking a human, um, or even cuddling a human, to be totally honest, but uh, I wouldn't mind cuddling a cuttlefish myself. However, there are octopuses that are actually a little bit dangerous. The most famous example is the blue ring octopus, which is a very tiny octopus. It's only about this big, but it has a venom, it has a venom in, its, in its bite that can actually paralyze and even kill a person, as well as just about any other animal that it comes across. So the blue ring octopus is, is a, a dangerous one that if you, know, if you come across one, you don't even want to go near the thing, because if it decides that it wants to bite or release venom, it can actually have, be pretty harmful. But, but that, those octopuses are so rare and, and, and so reclusive that it's pretty rare for people to, you really have to be trying to get bitten by an octopus in order to get bitten. Here at the aquarium, we have octopuses that are not venomous like that, that aren't, they don't have a deadly venom or anything like that. Our giant Pacific octopus actually does octopus encounters. People play with the giant Pacific octopus. Sometimes, and when the aquarium reopens, if you, if you get an animal encounter with the octopus, you can do this too. And they're fun to play with, and they're not aggressive at all. Our octopus is, is, a, is a pretty uh, curious and easygoing creature. Also very smart, by the way. Octopuses, of all the invertebrates, octopuses we think are pretty much the smartest. Now, what I know, I kind of lost track of which questions I've answered here. So another octopus question about, back going back to the changing color, Natalie asked, how long does it take for an octopus to change color? That is a good question. They can do it almost instantaneously. It happens so quickly that it's about as fast as any living thing can do anything. And the reason for this is because octopuses control their color change with, with, with direct directions from their brain down through their nerve endings. So as quickly as that, as that signal, which is an electrical signal since it's coming down the nerves, can get from the brain to those chromatophores and the chromatophores can open up in response, that, that, that's how quickly they can do it. Other animals that change color are oftentimes a little bit slower because things like uh, certain other kinds of animals use more like, chem like chemicals in their body to change color. So they might release a chemical, the chemical that causes the color change and that goes a little slower. But basically an octopus or a cuttlefish can change color as rapidly as their nerves are capable of carrying the signal. So many times in a second. And finally, I got a whole bunch more questions. What have I gotten through so far? Ooh, how do Nautiluses see? This is a good question too. So I've talked about the eye on the cuttlefish, right? The eye on the Nautilus is this thing right here. Yeah, so the, uh, the Nautilus has basically a pinhole eye. Um, the Nautilus's eye is nowhere near as sophisticated as the ones that you see in the other, uh, in the other cephalopods. Other cephalopods we know can see shapes and colors and they can, have, and they can see really a lot of detail. The Nautilus's eye doesn't even have a, a really a, a decent regular pupil, and it's really just a kind of a pinhole eye. I'm not actually even, I don't even think they have a lens in there, if I'm not mistaken, though. Somebody might double check me on that, but I'm pretty sure it's just, an, just basically this tiny opening. And a pinhole eye is not a great eye to have, but it doesn't, it's not useless. They can see the shapes of things around them, and they probably can't see any kind of color, but that's okay, because if you're living in a deep water environment and generally only hunting at night, color is not going to be much of an issue anyway. You're not really going to be able to see any colors unless you're coming also across some bioluminescent animals and stuff like that. And even their light tends to not show a lot of colors. Uh, let's see. What, any other questions before I wrap up here? 
Um, I think I've answered all of them. How do Nautiluses see? We just got to that one. Yeah, I think we've answered all our questions. So this has been an excellent uh, time, everybody. I've really enjoyed talking about these different adaptations. We started saying we're just going to talk about adaptations in general. We ended up talking a lot about pinnipeds, such as seals and sea lions and walruses, and also a lot about the adaptations of cephalopods, like octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, and nautiluses. I hope everyone enjoyed learning about those things. Remember, if you are watching this program after it's aired, you can still uh, ask us questions. If you just email us at live at lbaop.org, we will continue to answer questions on that email throughout the day. And also, for probably at least a couple more minutes, we'll be taking questions at that text number, 562-286-1838. And if you can't get a hold of us today, well, come back and join us next, not next week, tomorrow, <laughs> since it's Monday. We'll be doing five more, we'll be doing five more classes tomorrow, and you can find the information on what those are on our website. Uh, so it's been a great pleasure talking to everybody and learning about adaptations together. Remember, those are the things that help animals to survive, their body parts, their abilities, and I encourage you to keep looking for adaptations just in your everyday life, and not just on animals. Adaptations can be on any kind of living thing. All living things have adaptations because all living things have to live, right? So you can continue to explore these things even if you're just at home by looking at pets, looking at yourself, looking at a bug. There's all sorts of adaptations to discover anywhere, even, even on a house plant. So I hope you guys are having a great time at home. Thank you so much for joining us, all of, all of our friends out there. And we will be seeing you again tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.